This is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire Books, and I'm here with my friend and colleague, Patricia Ganger. How you doing, Patricia? Hi. So why don't you tell the audience what you do? So I am a teacher of the visually impaired, um, or teacher of visually impaired students, depending on exactly, I don't know, where you live, where you're from. You may have heard different things, or you might not have heard of me at all, or my kind of job. What I do is I teach students who are blind or visually impaired in the public school system. Um, so I work with students at all levels of visual impairment. I have some students who are what we would call legally blind, meaning that they have vision that is so severely limited that um, the government considers them blind, even though they have a little bit of functional vision. When I have other students who are what we would call totally blind, meaning that they have no light perception, can't see anything at all. Um, I am actually legally blind myself. I um, read in braille and in print. I walk with a cane. I um, So I'm right at that fun legally blind or what we might call low vision point where I cannot see well enough to drive a car, but I can see well enough to usually tell people apart or like look across a room and see shapes and colors and things like that. So that's kind of a little, little. Yes, bit. I can send you a text message. A what? <laughs> oh yeah you can send me text messages a text message i actually do uh, like <laughs> use the iphone like enlarging thing to like make everything on my phone really big so i can enlarge stuff so you know if you look at the screen normally oh, wow. and then you can make it super big and you can like pan around the screen and stuff so i use uh different accessibility features on all of my devices to be able to access things the way that everybody else does so speaking of accessibility, you are also an avid reader. In what yes. formats do you tend to read the most? So um, I guess let's talk first about what do I have access to, right? Because I do, I, when I was a little kid, I've been legally blind my whole life. So I, when I started, when I was a little kid, they taught me print and braille. And a person who does what I do now taught me print and braille and made that decision because they weren't sure if my vision, the amount of functional vision that I had was going to be stable. So I read large print or regular print with a magnifier. I can do that just fine. Or I can read in braille. Um, I love braille. I'm a big advocate for braille. I teach students braille at the school where I work. Um, <clears throat> But there are also audiobooks. And so actually in my adult life, I primarily listen to audiobooks. But just because for me, uh, individually, reading in print, even if it's large print and even if it's on a screen, can be eye straining after a while. Um, so if I'm reading something for pleasure, um, especially at large print is just not really going to do it for me. I also do a lot of that at my job. I, I do a lot of reading in print at my job, especially translating from print into braille is what I do a lot at work. So I end up using a lot of my eye strain, uh, a lot of my seeing time of reading words visually on work. Um, so then uh, other options that would be available to me are braille, which I love braille, like I said, but um Braille books are not always easy to get your hands on uh, by comparison to audiobooks. Like you can get an Audible account or you can, you know, download all kinds of audiobooks pretty easily, but getting those same kinds of books in print is much more challenging. Or not in print, in Braille. Ugh. I can't talk today. But so I actually do have a question about that. So how if a book comes out, yeah. how easy is it gonna be to get like a bestseller in large print or in braille? And like, how long does it take? I mean, do, do they come on the market at the same time? What kind of price differences are we talking about? Like, what is that like? They generally do not come out at the same time. Now it depends a little bit on what kind of bestseller you're talking about, because um, if it's kind of an, uh, it's kind of a strange thing. If it is a book that for whatever reason publishers decide might have a lot of the people who buy it are the older crowd. Sometimes you like, if it's the latest, um, like it's, it's like it's a political crime thriller kind of novel that they think like some older folks might like, you might find it in large print a bit more quickly. 
because that's who they think of as needing that uh, mm-hmm. needing that accommodation. So um, you might find those a bit more quickly, but Braille books, there is there's a lot of books that will never come out in Braille um, or that will take such a long time that, you know, it, it a whole lot of time will have passed. The biggest thing with Braille books um, is that they do take a lot of time to create. They are kind of expensive. Uh, they're actually quite expensive and they take a lot of time and they don't hold up as well as print books do because the nature of braille is that you have these like bumps that are on this paper and if you squish it too hard that can destroy your book that you just spent a lot of time and cost making so um there are only some libraries like public libraries will even carry braille books not all of them will um but the great thing about braille is that increasingly a lot of younger blind and visually impaired people have different kinds of technology that allow them to access a digital book, like an ebook, as if it were in Braille, which is pretty great. Um, st- some of the students that I work with use a Braille note or a Braille sense or a couple of other different um, small computer devices that in their heart, they're basically a tablet that has a flip down interface on the front of it that um, uses a Braille keyboard and has a Braille display. and those kinds of devices are especially great for our students because you can load up eBooks that you can download from the internet and put them on those devices. And then you have access to the whole library of the world. The problem is that those devices are themselves very expensive. And so though they are something that some of my students have because the school system has paid for them, I do not (laughs) because I do not have an extra five grand to spend on one. Uh, but as far as I, that makes sense. So basically accessibility is an issue either way. Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, it is Uh, because the biggest thing is that there's always a price. There's always a paywall to a lot of these things. Um, audiobooks for a while were the same way when I was growing up. Uh, I really relied very heavily on commercial audiobooks that, um, you know, my, you would go to like Barnes and Noble or Borders if you lived in the 90s and buy audiobooks and, you know, they were on CDs and I would get very excited and almost all of my presents for my family for like my birthday or holidays and things for years were like all shaped exactly the same because they were the commercial audiobook on CD. And um, oh. I, so, you know, it, it wasn't one of these things where, oh, it's so exciting. Let me pick up the package and see if it has a funny shape or if it rattles. It's like, oh, Patricia's stack is all like boxes that look exactly like this that are wrapped and they're all just different books. And, you know, it it was exciting. Um, So uh, commercial audiobooks were completely my jam. When I was in high school, I was that kid who would walk around with a portable CD player and extra batteries, not because I was listening to cool music. It was because I was reading books and I would carry around different audiobooks and have to change out my discs and change out my batteries all the time. And so I, but I read a lot even then, but now there are really cool other things available to us as, as blind and visually impaired people. There's actually now a number of services. There is a um, part of the Library of Congress called the National Library Service, and they've been running for a while to try to help provide books um, for free to, that were accessible to blind or visually impaired people. And you can sign up for this service and it's completely free. You just have to get certified that you actually are blind or visually impaired. And um, then they can mail things to you. And sometimes it's braille books for some folks. Sometimes when I was a little kid, it was books on audio cassette, but they're weird specialized audio cassettes. They weren't like normal audio cassettes that you could just like play in your car. Because again, I was born in the nineties. So there were audio cassette decks in the cars when I was a child. but they had a special audio cassette player that uh, you would have to put their specialized audio cassettes in that only worked with their player. And um, But they're a really, really wonderful service. And now they have kind of gone digital. And so there is an app called Bard, which is also a really great name for an app just anyway, because like it tells you stories and it's a it's Bard. Um, so Bard, uh, allows you to, through the National Library Service, you can look through their whole catalog and download audiobooks for free if you're a member or if you have signed up with the National Library Service. And that is actually the primary way that I read books 
um, at this point, mostly because of lack of time and, you know, paywalls of other things. So I listen to a lot, a lot of audiobooks that way, but, uh, at our job, um, at, at our place of employment, we, they recently started up a book club for some of the people who work there. And I went to the second session of it, but not the first one, because the first book that they were reading, I could not find as an audiobook anywhere. Um, and so that still does happen. Really? It happens less, but it does happen. Uh, so the first mm -hmm. book, the very, very first book they pick for this book club was not available as an audiobook, like anywhere that I could find, um, whether I had to pay for it or not. But then the second book that they had in the book club was available in Bard, and so is the third one. So I plan to read it. Um, but sometimes, and the thing that's really tough is especially, I'm a, I'm very interested in like sci-fi and fantasy stuff. And with a lot of those kinds of books, you have to get to a certain level of renown to be famous enough to have an audiobook. Like, you know, if, if I go to Dragon Con and there's just authors who have booths with their books for sale, they generally don't have audiobooks of their books. They, you know, sometimes do and sometimes don't. Um, so that's the kind of thing right. that can be kind of challenging sometimes is for a while when I was a younger human, um, I got really into those kind of suspense thrillers or political, like political suspense thrillers and things. And I still do kind of like them, but that was mostly because good luck in like 1998, trying to get a well-known fantasy book on an audio CD. Like it, it just, they, the publishers didn't, I guess at that time, think that those kinds of books were inclined to sell as audiobooks. which now what's really good is publishers as a whole have seen hey, other people listen to audiobooks. Like there's a really big market here for audiobooks and we can do audiobooks in all kinds of different genres. And it's not just, do you want the political thriller of the week or a self-help book? Because in the late nineties, that's what there was in audio <laughs> uh, or at least commercial audio. Um, so uh, there are a couple of other services now too. There's, um, there are a couple of other things that are specifically for blind or visually impaired people, much like the National Library Service. One of them is called Bookshare. Um, it, it works off of the same basic principle that you can get onto Bookshare if you have um, a visual impairment. Oh, the other thing about the National Library Service is it is also available to people who have any print access disability. And so that's really important for people who have dyslexia and other kinds of things that would mean that print Ooh. is fundamentally not accessible to you. So um, that's a really important thing that I always try to remember to say, but sometimes for, forget, because in my world, it's all blindness, blind people, people whose eyes don't work. But there are uh, many other types of print access disability that do qualify for those kinds of services, specifically including dyslexia. Um, so it's always important to make sure I say that. <laughs> Um, That's amazing. Okay, so I want to turn this conversation because you and I have talked a little bit about whether audiobooks actually constitute reading. Mm -hmm. So, and I want your opinion on the matter. It depends on what, why you're asking, right? Um, if I am in, if I'm a kindergarten teacher, and I'm teaching a whole classroom of little kids, and the skill we are learning to do is read, then no. Because the question is, are you learning to read? Or are you reading to learn, mm -hmm. right? And once you get to a certain point of school, and yes, I am a little bit school focused at this exact moment. I'll talk about adult people in a second. But um, once you get to past the point where you are learning to read and you are mo more focused on reading as an avenue to learning, then once you are to the reading to learn phase, I personally don't see that there's that much of a difference with a couple of key exceptions. It is very important to if audiobooks are your main way of accessing things, you have to put in extra work to learn how to spell words because you don't see them all the time. So the biggest thing that I can tell when I'm talking to adults or especially if I'm emailing with adults, I email with a lot of adults who are blind and visually impaired and there are, you know, they might have a lot of spelling errors or a lot of issues with homonyms um, because the primary way that they have engaged with literacy for quite some time is through audiobooks and the biggest piece you completely miss out on is spelling um so if you if uh, there are many times when you might not know how a character's name is actually spelled 
or uh, different things like that. So um, that to me is one of the big differences. And if you can think to yourself, oh, I don't really need to know how to spell this. I'm just reading for pleasure or I'm reading to understand this content, but knowing how to spell all the words in this might not be as important to me, then it, it is, you know, basically the same. Um, from an adult perspective, from a, are you getting all the information out of what um, is being provided? Now, there is one other factor, which is that there is a layer of interpretation between you and the text. And you have to always be aware of that. So a great example of this is, um, I used to really, and I, I still do, really like the um, Alphabet Murderer series that stars Kinsey Milhone that's written by Sue Grafton. And I really liked them as a young person. I still do. But, yeah, yeah. But I think they're funny because the audiobook reader, uh, Judy Kay, reads those books. And the droll tone that she uses sometimes is hilarious to me. My wife read the first one of those books and thought it was so boring and just did not understand what I saw valuable about it or what I thought was like funny about it until I introduced her to the audiobook. Because that reader does put a layer of interpretation between you and the text. So for certain kinds of things, if you are a literature major and you are trying to get a completely fresh, it is just the words and you trying to figure out what the, what the words are trying to tell you, then no, audiobooks are not going to be your main way of accessing that because there is this layer of interpretation of this audiobook reader. How did they pronounce that word? How did they emphasize that sentence? And audio in reading an audiobook at the end of the day is a performance, much like theater. Like you get people who that's what they do to read audiobooks a lot of the time, especially commercial audiobooks. So it's really important to know. And so these are just things that are important to know. If you're thinking to yourself, should I access this as a, should I try to access this in a different way or is an audiobook good enough? The things you would need to know are, is the spelling of the words important? Are these things you're going to need to know later? And are, um, is there a problem with there being a layer of interpretation between you and the text? So especially if um, you are an English major or something like that, that might not be what you want. So um, those to me are the kind of big differences. Now, with little, little kids, like I was saying before, I don't encourage audiobooks when teaching young, very young blind and visually impaired kids because they need to learn to read to the best of their ability. That, that's what their school lives are focused on at that time when they're in kindergarten, first, second grade. For a while, that is what their whole life should be is about learning how to read. But once you get to an older set, um, you know, obviously, they still need to practice the skill, but a lot of our students and a lot, a lot of blind and visually impaired people get to the point where accessing audiobooks is a much faster and more effective way to read certain kinds of things. Uh, and that also very much depends on the person. I have a couple of students who um, don't do as well in audiobooks than if we provide them with actual hard copy braille. And I, and more than willing to follow my students to whatever leads them to be successful. So I think if you're talking about a person who's like, I'm really successful with audiobooks, but sometimes I feel bad of, of is that reading? I don't think you need to necessarily feel bad about that. But if you are thinking to yourself, hmm, maybe I should make sure I have a toolbox of strategies that I'm not only using audiobooks exclusively to access things, that is something I'd be all for, making sure you have another reading medium if it's available to you, print, large print braille or whatever, um, to make sure you have those other strategies there for if you need them, because you don't necessarily want an audiobook for all kinds of things. And it's not always the go-to. Does that, I guess, make sense. make sense? How fast do you listen to your audiobooks again? I remember being shocked. Um, I listen to audiobooks very, very quickly. Um, let me look at my current audiobook that I was listening to and what it sounds like. Uh, Whoa. Yeah, that was uh, the biography. <laughs> of Alexander Hamilton. Uh, that was a biography about Alexander Hamilton talking about uh, 
like his early life and things like that. And that that's the rate at which I listen to audiobooks generally. I cannot process auditory information that quickly. To me, that is like amazing. <laughs> so visually, I actually read really, really fast. Mm -hmm. But when I listen to audiobooks, which I actually do more, I discovered them like this year and I'd never really thought I'd be an audiobook person, but it turns out I quite like them. I can't go past about like 1.3. Oh, yeah. Um... <laughs> Time speed. It's very, it's just like a little faster, but I, I like it pretty close to normal cadence. Uh. Two hundred two hundred seventy five i had that at 275% speed oh, that's awesome i'm like so impressed with that just because i could not so, <laughs> or maybe maybe in a few years who knows i also listen to a number of podcasts uh, i i'm a big podcast person and i cannot if i've been listening to a podcast on 2x which is generally how i listen to podcasts i do not turn them low, lower than 2x if um, my wife and I are in the car together and we're trying to listen to a podcast, she begs me to turn it down in speed. And I'm like, I can't do this. It's too boring. I cannot listen to language at this rate. <laughs> it is so, it, uh, honestly, it can be a problem sometimes. Uh, living in the Southeastern United States, there are a lot of people who talk slow. And sometimes I am making will saves like, okay, be cool. Do not rush them. Do not rush them. You need to sit here. You need to listen to their entire sentence and then respond. <laughs> because I, um, when I'm in audiobooks, <laughs> when I'm in audiobooks or podcasts, I can just turn it up. And it, it was really, um, I listened to this one podcast that I'm used to hearing this guy's voice at 2X. And then I watched a YouTube video that featured the same person. I'm like, what is wrong with him? Why is he talking so slow? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's yes. awesome. All right, so I, one more, uh, one more question before I let you go, which is, what are you reading right now? What do you recommend to my audience to read at this time? What's what's a good one? So my all time favorite book series is the King Killer Chronicles by Patrick Rothfuss. I I live for the King Killer Chronicles. I am waiting for the Doors of Stone. When that actually becomes a thing, I will. You might notice I'm just suddenly not at work because I'm at home reading The Doors of Stone. Um, but I, I really, really love that set of fantasy books. Though um, more recently, uh, it's a slightly, it's a spicy book, but I, my most recent book that gave me a lot of joy was Red, White, and Royal Blue. Um, it's actually like kind of a oh yeah, lighthearted romance story. It's wonderful and hilarious. And if you have ever thought to yourself, I don't really think that romance books are for me, read this one because it's um, kind of a, you know, a lot of the dialogue between, or a lot of the middle third of the book is in emails back and forth between two of the characters or in text message threads or the things that make it feel very modern, very fresh. And I love, 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 love that book. So those would be my two recommendations for right now. Fantastic. Patricia, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to come onto my channel and enlighten all of us about your experience of reading and also drop some good recs. Yeah, Thanks. happy to do it. Thank you. <laughs> and hopefully those of you who are watching, if you, if you liked it, please subscribe to the channel and leave us any comments below with any questions you might have. Happy reading, everybody.